right, we are now going to recap chapter 5. Let me read verses. Then I saw on the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll with writing on the inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. But no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look into look in it. And I cried and I cried because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even look in it. Then one of the elders said to me, stop crying, look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has been victorious so that he may open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing between the throne and the four living creatures of, and among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. He came and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you redeemed people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. They sang with a loud voice. The lamb who was slaughtered is worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say blessing and honor and glory and dominion to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. So here's the first way I want to unpack uh, this chapter. But before I do that, um, I want to bring out something that's key for interpretation of the book. So if you see in the first few verses, there is this scroll that has seven seals. Okay, let me start writing now. So there is this scroll. Let's let me. Let me uh, do it this way. Okay, that's not working. How about blue? Okay, that's not blue, but that works. So let's say this is a scroll. It's not. Uh, probably how it would look. But here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven seals. Now, the lamb is the one. The lamb who is slaughtered is the one who opens this book with seven seals. So. The lamb slaughtered, the one worthy, based upon him doing what he did, is what opens this book. And if you notice something, chapter 6 will have these seven seals begin to be unleashed. So something really key... So after chapter 5, the lamb slaughter opens the book with seven seals. And then in chapter 6, the lamb starts to open these seals. And, it, and, and these seals are talking about things and realities, dynamics and forces going on between the first and second coming of Christ. But they're all understood. So all these seals that are broken in chapter 6 are understood in light of the lamb slaughtered. So the key to understanding chapter 6 is understanding all the things that are open from the throne room of chapter 5 where the lamb slaughter takes his coronation where he triumphs now in the present in the realm of the heavenly domain as a slaughtered lamb. And from this, this slaughtered lamb comes the opening of the seal. So we need to understand everything. In chapter 6, in light of how it's understood, in light of the slaughtered, raised lamb. Now, something interesting happens. In the seventh seal, all of a sudden, you get seven trumpets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
So in the seventh seal of chapter six, there are seven trumpets. Okay, let's say, let's say, uh, you know, here's a trumpet. That's my trumpet. That's my trumpet. That's my trumpet. That's my trumpet. <laughs> That's my trumpet. And then, in the seventh trumpet, there are seven bowls. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's say here's my here's my here's my sausage. Okay, don't mind the artistry skills. So these seven seals cover a particular camera angle, and then you have seven trumpets which cover a particular camera angle, and then you have seven bowls. All of these are telling us about the slaughtered lamb. Let's say this is this is the slaughter lamb's first coming, and let's say this is the second coming. So the trumpets, the bulls, and the seals are explaining things between Christ's first and second coming in light of his first coming. Why why why, why am I saying this? Because these seals that are open are opened by the slaughtered lamb, and from him opening the seals by his cry, by his cross triumph. Then the seals are open, and then the last seal is connected to these trumpets and bowls. And so, wh why is that important? Because chapter five, what I'm trying to show you here, is that the whole book of Revelation, everything, whether it's a camera angle of the seals, the camera angle of the trumpets, the camera angle of the bowls, is to be understood in light of this scene in chapter five of gospel triumph. You understand all. Basically, John is saying. Understand all things in all times between Christ's first and second coming in light of the triumph of his first coming. Which is why this sets the temple for this and this and this. So that's just a very broad overview of how this scene where the Lamb opens the seals then opens up the, 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 the telling of the seal's history in chapter 6 and opens up from that the telling of the trumpet's history in chapter 8 and 9. And then that opens up the bulls later in Revelation as well. So here's, and I've just kind of given like a very broad overview, um, and I'll, I'll leave that up it doesn't, you know, if, it's, if it's helpful. Here, here's one teaching point as we look at chapter 5. And, and the first thing I see is there's a cosmic dilemma. There's this kingdom plight that's going on. And that's from the first few verses. So basically, we are learning that God is the king. He is ruling and reigning. He is reigning now um, in that place that John was taken up to. And at the end of that, there is a statement. God made all things. And because he made all things and, he's, and, he, and he oversees all things, he should be glorified in all things. But right after we are hearing about the supremacy of God and his glory as the creator and sustainer, we're brought into this dilemma. So great, God is king of all creation because he made all creation. But all creation is jacked up. All creation is dysfunctional. All creation is corrupt. So how do we acknowledge the, the sovereign rule of God and his glory that he made this created realm for how do what, what do we do with that so we see god as ruler to be glorified and the question is who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals but no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to even look at it and i cried and i cried because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even look at it so this scroll this is a title deed to the earth this is the title deed to human history and its goal. This is basically the, you could say, it's, it's a formal document where the ownership and trajectory and history, basically where the, 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 the right to rule and reign on this earth um, is represented by this. When I say right to rule and reign, I mean the right to rule and reign over a, a, a earth that is functioning the way it should. Now, this book shows up in, in, Gen in Jeremiah, where Jeremiah has this book that has these seals on it 
um, that he that represent him purchasing a place in the promised land after exile. So he he has his book that represents the ownership of a piece of property, and it's sealed with seven. It's sealed with seals, and it speaks about the ownership of this piece of land that will be that he he will have after exile. So so this is basically a title deed to the whole universe. Who can open up the right to unlock history, redeem history, and make all things right to the glory of God? And there's something very important about Revelation, is that as we consider this book, which speaks about the title deed to reality and existence, um, we have to realize that there is nobody ever, ever, anywhere in human history who can even look into the book. So we can't understand chapter 5. We can't understand the, the, the reality of Revelation and the gospel if we don't understand that nobody, nobody can even consider being worthy enough to do anything to make creation right, to bring about the new creation. There is nobody. In order for us to understand the gospel, you must understand that no human, no human morality, no human ruler, no human person, no human figure ever can even consider looking at this book to bring things to be right. Caesar cannot look in this book. America cannot look in this book. A particular president cannot look in this book. Nobody can look in this book when it's speaking about the making of all things the glory of God right. No one can look at it. No one can consider it. It is not something even up for discussion. Now, this is a cosmic dilemma. Listen, this is talking about this whole universe and the whole cosmos being made right, which means that this is very important. Jesus' work that he we're about to see in coronation celebration format, the lamb slaughtered, it is something that speaks about the restoration and recreation of all reality. Jesus' death and resurrection is not just about personal souls having a personal reconciliation. This is about the whole existence and known realities being made right. The gospel is not just some personal privatized remedy. The gospel is a remedy to everything that is wrong in reality. One day, the gospel will be the sole reason, the work of Christ, the slaughtered lamb, will be the sole reason why galaxies and molecules and plants and animals and everything will be in a God glorifying functionality. Okay? This is a cosmic dilemma, meaning that there is there is a problem in the world that can only be solved by one figure who is no one in the world except the Christ who would come into the world. And and the solution is only what this God man will do. It's not in the cosmic dilemma is not by a particular government, not by a particular ideology, not by a particular philosophy, not by a particular scientific discovery. The cosmic dilemma of making the world right is not be is not found in anywhere except in the slaughter lamb that comes into the scene. So before we understand the glory of the gospel, we must understand that it, 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 it is about a cosmic issue. A cosmic issue that, that touches all reality's wrongness because of our wrongness. And a cosmic solution that is not found in anyone. There is nobody who can even consider taking this book to open it. Only the slaughtered lamb. So we got to understand the cosmic dilemma. Second thing we have in this chapter, we have to understand the cosmic scandal. The, the, and another way I can say this, is the kingdom establishment. So there's a plight, there's the kingdom's plight, and, and then here we have the kingdom's esta establishment. And the reason why I say it's a cosmic scandal is because John says that the solution to make all reality right, the solution to unlock the title deed of the earth and bring history to its God-glorifying end, the solution to who will bring the creator of all things glory is in a slaughtered lamb. That is not at all what we would think to be the solution. We would not think a perpetual icon and figure of weakness 
and 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 and, and being dominated and slaughtered would be the reality of restore, rest, rest, restoring power. Stop crying, look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has been victorious. So the solution is this lion-like figure who is also a lamb. Now, there's something very important we need to understand about this whole scene. The tribe, the lion from the tribe of Judah is making a reference to Genesis 49. Now, let me read Genesis 49 for you quickly. Some prophetic statements about the 12, the 12, uh, the 12 figureheads of Israel. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Speaking about Judah. Your hand will be on the necks of your enemies. Your father's son will bow down to you. Judah is a young lion. There's that lion-like imagery. My son, if you return from the kill, he crouches, he lows, lies down like a lion or a lioness who dares to rouse him. This is a key verse. The scepter will not depart from Judah or the staff from between his feet until he who is right it is comes. The obedience of the peoples belongs to him. So Genesis 49 is talking about Judah. Someone's going to come from Judah who is going to have this scepter of kingdom authority and dominance and he will bring the allegiance of the peoples. So when John says right here that the lion from the tribe of Judah is here, what John is saying is that right now we are seeing the kingdom of of God that was announced in the times of, of, of Genesis by the patriarchs. We are now seeing the kingdom of God being inaugurated through the slaughtered lamb. It is th This kingdom that was announced is being established by the slaughter of Christ. Now all this, all this, all this singing, okay, all this singing it, it would be understood by the original audience as coronation songs. This is not just about a salvation accomplishment of for sinners. This is a coronation of a king over his peoples, which is why Genesis 49 is stated. And also the root of David is stated. So the root of David speaks about the Davidic person who pointed to the Davidic kingdom that would be fulfilled not by David himself, but by David's greatest Son, this is this this cosmic scandal is that God is establishing his kingdom on earth through the defeat of God's son on the cross. It is a kingdom that is established where where, 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 where God is worshipped in this domain of, of peoples that have been established by the slaughter of the lamb. But notice something else is very important. It says that this person. He comes to the one who has a scroll, which is the Father, and he takes the scroll out of the right hand seat on the throne. Now again, John is also alluding to Daniel 7 again. Remember, let me go back to, to read it again. Remember and in, in earlier in the book, the illusion of Daniel chapter 7? Well, here we have Daniel chapter 7 was anticipating what is going on right here in Revelation 5, after the resurrection. It says, I saw one, verse 13 of Daniel 7, like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days. So we now have, the, the, Daniel is picturing this coronation scene where the Son of Man will approach the Ancient of Days. For what? He was given an authority to rule and a glory and a kingdom so that every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So right now, John is giving a vision to the church of Jesus being coronated as the now ruler of a kingdom. That is extremely, extremely paradoxical, okay? Jesus conquers a kingdom through him being conquered. 
Jesus delivers us through being defeated. In weakness, he brings about the divine conquering power of the kingdom. As he is dominated by sin, death, and, 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 and these forces that, that, that he experienced on the cross. As he's dominated, he becomes the dominating one. As he's slaughtered, he becomes a ferocious conqueror. As he's abandoned, we are reconciled. As he dies, as he dies, we experience eternal life. This kingdom that has been established by Jesus in a paradoxical way is supposed to give us a framework for all the things that we deal with. So if Jesus triumphed over reality and he earned a kingdom, he inaugurated a kingdom through the slaughtering experience of Calvary for us, then it gives us this paradox for how we see the way we live in the kingdom. We move forward. Jesus moved forward by moving backward, which means that we advance the kingdom forward as we seemingly move backwards in defeat and difficulty and struggle and failure. This is very different because Babylon's kingdom, they will see, is all about moving forward by moving forward. It's all about conquering by being the conqueror. It's all about dominance by being the dominator. It's not this lamb-like paradox where it's backwards flipped around. But this kingdom that has been established by the slaughtered lamb is a final kingdom. It says he has been victorious. The book of Revelation is not about the church in the name of Jesus seeking to pursue a victory. The, the Revelation is basically saying to the church, listen, Jesus has already been victorious over this realm and he's always he's established a kingdom based on that victory. Basically, John is saying that Jesus has already done everything that needed to be done. Now all that needs to be done is for us to see the full effects of it blossom in the consummation. But he has been victorious. There is no need to defeat the devil. There is no need to triumph over reality through some cultural, you know, religious war. He has been victorious. Now he is victorious. Now we are in the victory of the king and the kingdom. And he is standing perpetually in the triumph of that slaughtered lamb reality. He stands there perpetually. It is in the perfect tense that he is standing as a slaughtered lamb, which means that he is always, always standing in heaven in the power of his slaughter. It is a slaughter that gives the power. It is, it is the kingdom of God that is all about the power of the slaughter that gave the victory once and for all in history already. We are living in the final victory of the cross. We are living in the power of the cross. We are living in the perpetual, never-ending sufficiency of the slaughtered lamb. He is revealed. Listen, Jesus could have been revealed to us in all sorts of ways in this book. He could have been revealed to us as the teacher. He could have been revealed to us as the miracle worker. He could have been revealed to us as the teacher and the instructor, as the rabbi. He could have been revealed to us in all sorts of ways. But what we see here is that he is seen as the one who established a kingdom by living as the glorious slaughtered lamb crucified and raised in heaven. He is perpetually seen as such. And you know what's interesting about this vision? is At the center of everything, at the center of everything is the lamb slaughtered. At the center of the throne, it says, it says at the center of the throne is the slaughtered lamb. At the center of heaven, at the center of the heavenly beings, at the center of everything is this slaughtered lamb. Obviously, Jesus is, is, is not slaughtered perpetually, but he's, he's presented in the efficacy, in the efficiency of his slaughter in history. He is at, at the center of everything in heaven is the power of the slaughtered lamb. So think about when you think about God's throne, when you think about power, when you think about God's rule and reign, when you think about heaven, at the center of it all is the power of the once for all victorious work of the cross. The cross is, is the, listen, heaven is about the centrality 
of the cross event. The throne of God is about the centrality of the cross event. At the center of this domain and, and this kingdom and this coronation and this realm is the slaughtered lamb. And notice that he slaughtered, it says, with seven horns. Seven horns speaks about divine power. It speaks about completeness, divine omnipotence. So basically what John is saying is that this kingdom was inaugurated by Jesus slaughtered. And guess what? All the power of divine omnipotence, God's full divine omnipotence is now being experienced and expressed by the power of the crucified slaughtered lamb gospel. The gospel is not just sentimental ideology. The gospel is not just some personal um, reality that takes you to heaven someday. The gospel is not just um, forgiveness of sins. The gospel is seven-horned, complete divine omnipotent power that gores and consumes and transforms and runs through anything in its path. At the center of this kingdom, at the center of this realm, is the lamb slaughtered. And guess what? He has divine, conquering, omnipotent, unstoppable power in his gospel grace. It is seven-horned gospel power. And I love how John says something very interesting. The seven horns and the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. So the seven spirits of God speaks about not seven spirits, but the sevenfold spirit of God. The spirit has complete power. And guess what? The spirit is the one who is working the power of the gospel on the earth. So if you think about father in chapter four, if you think about the slaughtered lamb in chapter five, and you think about the spirit, what basically God is saying is that God is ruling and reigning on this earth through the power of the work of Jesus that is being applied by the sevenfold Spirit of God. Where is God ruling and reigning now on this planet? Where do we see God's rule and reign? It's where the Spirit is applying the power of the cross. That's how God is ruling. God is ruling through the work of Jesus and through the Spirit that is connecting those on the ground to the Christ who is slaughtered and resurrected in heaven. So just refreshing. We need to understand the kingdom's plight, the kingdom dilemma, the cosmic scandal, and how the kingdom is established by this slaughtered lamb, once and for all victory. Thirdly, we need to understand the new cosmos, the new creation, the kingdom people. So what does this, as this kingdom is established, what do we see next? We see a new creation. We see the kingdom people. We see this new creation that God is bringing about through those who are coming to know the slaughter lamb in the power of the spirit. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one of them had a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you redeemed people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you made them a kingdom of priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. So when, when, when God says, look, this lamb who is victorious in this paradoxical where he is, he dominates, he dominates this world. He he rules and reigns through him being dominated. He conquers through being conquered. When you consider that, where where is it that we're seeing this reign, this dominance, this, this kingdom? Where? Where? And we see it's being experienced by those who have been made a kingdom and priests to our God. We're seeing it in those who have been purchased by the slaughter. So God is he has triumphed through his son. And now we see that through those who you redeemed for God by your blood to those, because you were slaughtered and you redeemed people for God by your blood. So this kingdom is being seen in the new creation community that has been made, made by the gospel, made by the purchasing blood of Christ there in verse 9. This is where we see God now restoring and renewing and bringing about his 
restoration of reality. It's in the church. It's in those who have been rescued out of, redeemed by the blood, and now are, are part of this tribe, this tribe, this tribe, this people who are kingdom priests. And so what's interesting about, about what is said here is that John is saying is that the church is, is, is a people that are to focus on what God is doing in the church and not so much what the church is doing in the world. So in all this language is saying, listen, God is doing something. The king is doing something on this earth. There is ruling and reigning going on this earth. They will reign on the earth. And where is this happening? It's where God is acting. God is moving in the church. God is making his kingdom known. He is taking back the world that is his as he creates a church covenant people. So as we see all this, as, 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 as we see the chaos, as we see the craziness, John is saying, look at what God is doing in recreating the earth through the recreated people that are now being renewed in the purchasing blood of, of Jesus. I love how it says they are a kingdom and priest to God on the earth. So basically what, what John is saying is that we are a people who are spreading over the globe places where we can now have sacred space to be a nation and kingdom not like in, in much greater ways than it was in exodus chapter 19 we are now all over this globe we're, we are establishing places where people can commune with god as priests in covenant fellowship we are we are establishing holy sacred space where people can unite in, in union with christ can experience a nearness to God as priests. So we're we're basically we are extending a we are extending temples on this earth where people can encounter the God who redeemed them through Christ in these places where we are establishing worship centers that are centered on the gospel. So the church is supposed to be focusing on establishing God's rule and reign, or I should say, or I should say um perpetuating, announcing, um, bringing about God's rule and reign, not through the conquering of culture, not through the dominating of society, not through common endeavors and common good, but through these people who are now experiencing the lamb slaughter's powerful, dominating, rest, re restoring work in and through these places where there is a kingdom of priests. So God's kingdom on earth is about what the Christ in heaven has accomplished. God's kingdom on earth, where, where is God ruling and reigning on earth? It's, it's, it's based upon those who are being united to and coming into the realm and reality of Christ in heaven accomplishments. So just recapping, as we look at Revelation 5, we see this, we see this cosmic dilemma and there's, there's, there, there's a cosmic issue and there's only one cosmic solution and it's nobody, it's only Christ. And then we see him come in in this scandalous way he establishes a kingdom he conquers he 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 does what is necessary in this very paradoxical strange way and then we begin to see this new creation community these people who have been purchased who have been redeemed and who are now a kingdom of priests who are ruling and reigning on earth not in the common spaces and not in the civil institutions but they are experiencing the kingdom in union with Christ, there is a kingdom that God is building. So basically, what, what, what chapter 5 is really setting us up for in the rest of the book is John is saying, listen, God has, God has inaugurated a kingdom of grace in the covenant community. And now you are going to see how that kingdom of grace is the dominant force that, that, that is, is, is bringing about God's rule and reign on this earth that he deserves through the establishment of these places that are called local churches on the globe. This is the kingdom people. This is the new creation that is, that is all about those who are united to Christ. But here's a third point. And I say third point, I mean fourth point. We see the kingdom people. We also see the kingdom we see kingdom collaboration, or I like to say cosmic cohesion. Cosmic cohesion, 
kingdom collaboration. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also of the living creatures and the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. And they sang, they said with a loud voice, the lamb who was slaughtered is worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength. So a kingdom is established. A new creation people is brought into this this this, 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 this kingdom. And then all of a sudden we see the unity. All of a sudden you see that there's all these people from different tribes and tongues and peoples and nations. You see angels that are different kinds of beings. And you see other kinds of angels. There is this unity. There is this collaboration. There is this cosmic universal oneness that is based upon all of them having a primal, a, a primal concern, a primal joy, a central, a central reference point to the lamb who was slaughtered. So Babel, Babel is, is this picture of division. It's this picture of separation of the nations, of the peoples. Well, the division starts there because they're all trying to build a name for themselves. And so God scatters. And so since that, there's been this perpetual question. How will God establish a people for himself that are unified together in all of their distinctions? And the answer to that, the answer to that is that someone must be slaughtered redemptively for sinners and bring all of those sinners into fellowship with God, into covenant right with God, solely because the Lamb did something for them, not because of them. And so we see that cosmic cohesion, that this universal oneness that needs to occur to the glory of God is only when heavenly beings... And all kinds of sinners of all kinds of categories are being centralized around the cross and nothing else. There is no universal unity. There is no cohesion amongst nationalities, amongst your, your, your economic categories. There is no, there is no cohesion through, through, through human um, efforts to, to be cohesive, to human attempts to say we should be one and we must be one. Let's get along. There is no cosmic cohesion through being ecumenical and saying, let's just all accept one another in all of our differences. There is no universal cohesion. There is no kingdom collaboration through race or through culture becoming the unifier. It's, it, it can, there can be no universal collaboration or cohesion to the glory of God through political unity, through economic and unity of any sorts. There is only one way that God can be glorified with oneness, and that is when everybody has been absorbed and defined primarily by the slaughtered lamb being their rescuer solely for his own activities. So God sees this reality. There is no solution. Christ comes and he is coronated as a solution. And he, he wins. He's victorious in this paradoxical, unseen, but real way. And he makes a new people who have been redeemed from every tribe and people and tongue and language. And they are priests. They are a new community, a new humanity where God is not trying to recreate and make the old creation better, but he's making a new creation in Christ. And these people are united and they're cohesive and they're collaborating because Christ is the center. No other center can bring collaboration, which is all, which is why in this current day and age and climate, all of the, the idea that we're going to collaborate as we all collaborate with some current hashtag, some cultural agenda, some cultural concern, whether it's how we police, whether it's how we vote, whether it's how we process a particular race issue, there can be no cosmic God-glorifying unity if it is not entirely about the lamb slaughter being the confession, being the celebration, being the definition of things unified. Here we have, here we have the world being truly God-centered through having a true unity that's entirely built on the coronation of the cross who was crucified, of, of the Christ who was crucified for us. Cosmic cohesion, kingdom collaboration. And here's the last thing. So we have the cosmic dilemma, the cosmic solution, the cosmic new creation. Cosmic cohesion, now we have the cosmic cause causes. 
or another way I could say is the kingdom's effect. Verse 13, I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, and everything in them saying blessing and honor and glory and dominion to the one seated on the throne as the lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down in worship. So what we see here is that there is a problem. Christ being crucified and raised is a solution. And as these people, as these people experience this event, as these people sing of this event, as these people celebrate this event, as these people tell of this event, as these people are defined by this event, as these people are unified by this event, there is this endless list of effects. There's these endless consequences. They keep on worshiping. They keep on responding. And, and so it's like this, it's like this crescendo. It's like the effect after effect, domino after domino, event after event. So, so the Christ comes down and he wins. We experience that. We, we, the Spirit of God brings us into the triumph of Christ. He makes us a kingdom of priests. And the power of this celebration of the work of the Lamb slaughtered, it just, it keeps bringing worship. It says, these people are saying, blessing God. We bless God. We want to honor God we, we want the, to the glory of God. All things go to him, you know, power and riches and honor and glory and strength. So basically, the more these people are experiencing this kind of Savior and this kind of triumph, the more they receive this, the more they marry it in this, the more they tell this, the more they rejoice in the slaughtered lamb's work, the more there is a perpetual crescendo and there is a response and there is a reflex. There is a amen. There is a worship. And so what, we learn, what we're going to learn in the book of Revelation is that what happened 2,000 years ago in the, when Jesus did what he did and went to heaven and he's coronated, when the church is experiencing this, when the church is being defined by this, when the church is looking at this in the midst of chaos and turmoil, there is endless effects that never cease to crescendo and climax that keep unfolding and being pushed out of this cross of it. In some sense, what we're going to learn is that all of human history as it pertains to the church is in some sense how this event in chapter 5, this triumph in chapter 5, this victory is just perpetually just doing endless things to bring worship and glor God-glorifying acts and God-glorifying worship over and over again. In some sense, we're going to learn as we go to Revelation how chapter 5 pushes the church all the way into the eschaton eternity. This cross, this Christ who is triumphing this way already, it is going to endlessly cause things, endlessly cause worship and obedience and transformation. It's going to endlessly cause all the beauty and bliss of the new creation. In some sense, the climax of chapter 5 is the climax of history. It's the climax of eternity. And what we're going to see is how this event, how the cross, how the power, the seven-horned power of the slaughtered lamb is going to endlessly do endless things that will never cease to be endlessly effective for the people of God who experience it all the way into new creation. We are going to see how the cross of Christ and the slaughtered lamb's triumph is this crescendo that will never stop having effects and consequences all the way into the end. And you say, well, what are you talking about? It says in the new creation when, when, when God makes everything finally right, now the church is experiencing the new creation in the already where it's partially right, even though things are positionally in, in, in the sight of God, okay? It says that the lamp, that the, the, that the light of the new creation is the lamp of the Lamb. The beauty and clarity and, 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 and holiness of the new creation, the way things will be seen is the lamp of the Lamb. Meaning that this event... This gospel event and this gospel triumph and this gospel kingdom will illuminate things forever in the power of its triumph. So Revelation 5 is the filter by which we see every single event, every single thing from Christ, between Christ's first and second coming and all the way into eternity. Chapter 5 is basically the most important chapter um, that the Christian considers 
as they consider the gospel's implications for the present and the future. And so we're going to see chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, all the way to 22, in light of how the opening of the seals by the triumph of the slaughtered lamb now informs the rest of history and how we see the glory of Christ overshadow everything. We will see all things through the filter of this gospel triumph in chapter 5.